Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the third installment of our Race, Equity, and Public Policy Speaker Series. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. This speaker series was created to highlight the role that structural, institutional, and interpersonal racism plays in the development of a public policy and its outcomes. It's multi-layered, it's intersectional, but it's so critical to our understanding of public policy. And we recognize that with this amazing series that we have. Um, these conversations and analyses are really essential identifying what tools we need um, to create more racially just and equitable outcomes. Uh, structural racism is a wicked problem, as we see. Shameless plug to the Wicked Problems event on Tuesday night. Um, it's both urgent and longstanding. It's not new. Um, so we've got to really up our game on all of this um, in terms of addressing this incredibly wicked problem. So we're committed as a school to raising awareness, to leveraging our resources, um, to being a part of this fight uh, and to engage in this work. And this series is definitely an example. Our incredibly fantastic lineup continues today with Dr. Frazier. And now I will turn it over to Professor Hackshaw to introduce our speaker. Well, today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Lori Frazier. Um, Dr. Frazier is an associate political professor of political science and African-American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research interests include racial and ethnic political behavior, African-American politics, women in politics, immigrant political incorporation, and state and local politics. She became the first African-American woman in 2015 and the first woman of color to earn tenure and promotion in the political science department at UCLA. Bravo. Um, her book, Racial and Ethnic Politics in American Suburbs, um, is the winner of two National Book Awards by the American Political Science Association. Since 2008, Dr. Frazier has served as the co-principal investigator of the Collaborative Multiracial Post-Election Survey, which is the first multiracial, ethnic, multilingual post-election study of political preferences and behavior among registered voters in a presidential election. The 2020 CMPS, uh oh, now you guys can tell I'm reading. <laughs> Sorry. Through its inclusive model of resource building, the CMPS um, has created resource sharing workshops, research and publication opportunities, and has changed the way data is collected and shared between interdisciplinary groups of researchers and builds a diverse and dynamic academic pipeline of scholars in the social sciences and related fields. Dr. Frazier's research projects and initiatives have received grant support from numerous funders, including the NSF, as well as a multi-year research grant from the American Political Science Association. Dr. Frazier received her PhD and master's in political science from the University of Maryland. She also received a master's in public policy from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's in political science from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Frazier is the proud, a proud first-generation college graduate, born and raised on the south side of Chicago. So now I will gladly turn it over to Dr. Lori Frazier. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, just want to give Dr. Hackshaw a shout out and say thank you so much for inviting me back to my alma mater. It's such an honor to be with you today. I wish that we could fellowship in person and share ideas in person, but it's just really good to be here and to share my research. I first fell in love with scholarship around racial and ethnic communities and field work, um, writing my dissertation and collecting focus group data in Northern Virginia and in Maryland and so many various suburbs outside of Washington, DC. Um, conducting interviews and working with community-based organizations. And so um, you, you uh, uh, Dean Orr, you noted my background, but I'm noting your background is near and dear to my heart. And so it's really an honor to be here with you today. I also wanted to note that I stand on the shoulders of so many giants at the University of Maryland. My dissertation chair, the late, great Linda Faye Williams, who trained me um, in the arenas of American politics and social policy. And so without her, and I know that she um, passed on untimely some years ago, but without her, I wouldn't be here today. So I just wanted to pay respects to Dr. Williams as well as Ron Walters, because they had such a huge and tremendous impact on so many scholars around the country who are products of the University of Maryland. 
All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and screen share. And give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides well. Okay, wonderful. And I'm gonna make sure I can see each of you. So I'm gonna make this a little bit larger. Just give me just a second. All right, so I wanna to continue to have my slides but feel some energy as well from the audience. Okay, so um, the presentation today is gonna to take the following format. First, if you indulge me, I have to tell you about the CMPS, the Collaborative Multiracial Post-Election Survey, for which I'm going to draw on the most recent data, just hot off the press, only a few weeks that we've had access to the 2020 CMPS, which we collected after the national election, and we were in the field for many months and yield uh, nearly 20,000 cases. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this survey for which I've served as a principal investigator, lead principal investigator for the last three elections, the last three cycles in 2020, 2012, 2016, and now 2020. And um, this survey that's funded with more than $1.2 million from the National Science Foundation um, is more than a national survey. As Alana noted, it builds an academic pipeline of scholars. And this is near and dear to my heart, not just to produce high quality and access to high quality um, national survey data for the social sciences, for public policy, for psychology and fields and disciplines beyond, but bringing together this multidisciplinary group of nearly 250 researchers at various stages of their careers. We have um, uh, faculty and graduate students from nearly 100 academic institutions, including HBCUs, minority serving institutions like Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, R1s, and teaching colleges. And so I couldn't be more excited to share in the first um, 10 minutes or so about the CMPS. And then drawing on that data, I'm gonna go into my most recent book project, which is an extension of the work that I did um, in Maryland, in Northern Virginia, when I was looking largely at newer immigrant and ethnic minorities who had moved to the emerging suburbs. Now, almost 20 years ago, I can't believe it was 19 years when I first started the research when those areas were kind of purple, but now solidly blue, right? So um, this project is mixed method. Um, it utilizes national survey data and, and as well as focus groups that are going to be getting off the ground here in, um, in, uh, in, win in the winter quarter with many, many um, uh, native language graduate students who will be helping to conduct interviews in various languages um, here starting in Orange County. Um, the, the partisan gender gap, uh, we want to talk a little bit about that and presidential vote choice as well as race, ethnicity, gender, and attitudes. I'm going to focus your attention on my research related to a different way of thinking about sexism, not modern sexism in the ways that many political scientists have studied it using the American National Election Survey, but looking at ambivalent sexism, which is a psychological approach that's 25 years in the making, but has now being applied to political research. I'm also going to look at uh, racial resentment and then focus our attention on just a taste of some of the policy views that the CMPS has to offer legal abortion, undocumented immigration, as well as gender views on the COVID mask, on a potential COVID mask mandate. All right. So I'm going to draw on um, the paper that was published um, in 2018, um, Best Practices for Collecting Online Data with Asian, Black, Latino, and White Respondents. And it's just an opportunity, if you're so inclined, to look under the hood to see how, to, how we put together this uh, groundbreaking collaborative. So the 2008 and 2012 CNPS was your standard, a couple of, a couple of faculty with, with resources getting together, pooling their resources, collecting a post-election survey with thousands of cases across race and ethnicity. Um, we, were, we contributed to the discipline. However, it, wasn't, uh, it didn't have the impact that going big, going collaborative could have. It was sort of your standard um, faculty hoard the data until it's so old and then they put it on a data repository like the ICPSR. We wanted to change the game in 2016 and we wanted to do things differently that would open up opportunities for more than just those faculty with the resources to access and to collect high quality data. We wanted to have an opportunity through a cooperative um, to open up access more broadly. The, so the CMPS in 2016 went cooperative. 
It was the first uh, cooperative 100% user content driven, meaning that um, individuals who wanted to join the cooperative, they purchased time on the survey. And it's unlike some other cooperatives where you only get the questions that you purchase, but everyone gets every question. Um, and in the case of um, 2016, we had 394 questions. Well, on average, it was about a 43-minute survey. And it was groundbreaking in multiple languages. Um, and we brought together a team of 86 social scientists from 55 different universities across 17 different disciplines who wanted to come together. Now, 2016 was without NSF money, showing that a cooperative can be self-sustaining with scholars who come together with a shared interest to collect high quality data. All right. A little bit about the 2016 cooperative here. He's asking me to admit people, but I can't do that. Okay. Okay, so the 2016 CMPS was a full adult sample of both registered and non-registered voters. The data for registered voters comes from the National Voter Registration email, uh, database email sample, and non-registered vote registered adults were randomly selected from several nationally representative, uh, reputable panel vendors. And again, this reaches beyond sort of your standard use of knowledge networks or um, uh, YouGov. And we reached out to six, seven different kinds of panel vendors so that we could collect data on hard to reach populations. And by working with several panel vendors, we reduced non coverage bias and also brought in panel vendors who actually had an expertise in recruiting minority respondents into their panels. And our, our project partner, um, uh, it remains specific market research. And in doing so, these 86 crazy folks came together to collect um, this data. And we had a shared interest in having a large sample size of Latino, Black, Asian, and whites in such a consequential election as 2016. And we ended up collecting 10,000 cases. And from that, we have dozens of populations, uh, dozens of articles, um, many of which are, are featured on our website. Um, and I'm just so proud of, um, in just a short amount of time, the kind of uh, knowledge that we've been able to grow around issues of public policy and politics across race and ethnicity. Um, another thing that's an important feature of the CNPS, and that is not just a uh, high quality national survey, but it is an anchor to grow research in the social sciences in public policy and beyond. We feature research uh, workshops, writing retreats, um, we, um, both at UCLA as well as in Washington, DC, bringing together researchers at varying stages of their research career. We pay close attention to funding scholars who otherwise could only afford to go to one research conference per year. And we bring those scholars either to DC or to UCLA um, fully funded. And so that, that is something that we're committed to making sure that we're opening up not just opportunity to collect high quality data, but that people can have an opportunity to fellowship and engage with one another and present their research um, without having feel, feeling as though it's cost prohibitive. We also encourage proactively co-authorships um, with racial and ethnic diversity, gender balance, and junior senior collaborations. So for 2020, we expanded to 2016's National Cooperative of Scholars, now up to around 250 scholars who joined the co-op co co cooperative. Um, the goal of this project was to build on 2016. Again, it's user content driven and everyone gets all, um, as I'll note in a moment, um, we had 250 uh, end users um, from 100 different colleges and universities. Um, the survey questions were user generated. Um, and it is a online self-administered format. In 2020, we expanded the language availability um, and not only English, Spanish, um, Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese, but we also have Arabic, Urdu, Farsi, and Haitian Creole. And I'll talk about the, the reason for that. We expanded um, to many oversamples, and I'm, I'm excited to share that in just a moment. The sample included registered voters from the 2020 election, as well as non-registered adults, um, including non-citizens. So in 2020, it was quite a long survey, right? And we were able to um, garner now up to nearly 20,000 cases. We, the survey contained over 800 unique questions, um, including split samples, branch items, um, group-specific questions, 
and the average respondent, so not every respondent got every question. So if you were an African-American respondent, maybe you got more questions related to Black Lives Matter. If you were a Latino respondent, perhaps you got more questions related to immigration or other policy issues. But every researcher had access to all questions. The average respondent got about 500 uh, questions. Respondents were able to pause the survey at any time and return for completion. And respondents who paused the survey were sent reminders and incentive to complete the survey. So our first data release happened just a few weeks ago, and we were able to release 14,000 cases of adults. Um, we call the primary sample, for which I'll be presenting research from this primary sample today. Um, around 4,000 Latino, around 4,000 Black, nearly 4,000 Asian and around 3,000 white non-Hispanics. The final data set has nearly 20,000 cases and we're cleaning the data right now. We're getting ready to weight some of the oversamples where we can. Um, it also includes around 1,500 youth, 16 to 17 year old. And those youth two years from now are going to be of age, right? They're going to be coming possibly into the electorate. So we're starting a little bit early with trying to capture the public opinion and political behaviors of youth. And so this will add collectively about another 4,500 cases from the oversample, and that is going to be released to our end users in just a few weeks. In order to do this, is building partnerships, building collaborations to make sure that this vision comes to fruition. And the CNPS beyond the 2008 and 2012 and 2016, by 2020, by 2020 we wanted to open up um, and really reach out to the Afro-Caribbean population, the Black immigrant population, LGBTQ, Muslim Americans, Native Americans, and Native Hawaiians. By doing so, we brought on some of the top scholars in the nation to help us develop um, the survey content and collect the data for these hard to reach populations. All right. Um, the final slide I'll show here is just noting that it's more than just an individual level survey, that we have a team that um, will also um, merge vote history over the last uh, various vote cycles, congressional district data, COVID-19 data from John Hopkins and other places, police and criminal justice data, immigration data, as well as data scraping of Facebook, Twitter, and those other social media, so that our full CNPS for 2020 will have a strong individual level data set, but also an aggregate level data set with various different kinds of appended data. So I'm very excited about that. And I want to invite everyone on the call, including especially graduate students and undergrads, if you want some research experience, you can go here to the CMP survey and you can look, uh, take, a, take a look at the um, uh, the top line report actually is posted now, so I should change that. But also the um, list of contributors is, is there, and we invite you to reach out to someone who maybe has shared research interests because the data is embargoed to the contributors for up to two years before it is made public through ICPSR. But we strongly encourage co-authorships, and those co-authorships can start tomorrow, right? Okay. So thank you so much for indulging me and let me share with you about this exciting and groundbreaking research project that I know is changing the way data is collected in the social sciences and public policy and beyond. All right, so let's move on to the application of some of this data in my own research, um, women and the race gap in American politics and public policy. So the goal of the book project is to examine Black, Latina, Asian, and white women's political behaviors and attitudes, as well as their public policy views, and how these views vary by geographic type. So if anyone's familiar with my earlier research, I care deeply about geographic space, particularly American suburbs. Not all suburbs are created equal. Some of you live in Prince George's County or Montgomery County or Fairfax. You know that the public goods and services are different depending on where you live. Right? So I still remain committed to understanding some of these attitudinal and policy issues by geography. So that's part of the broader book project. I take an intersectional theoretical lens to my work. It's all deeply grounded in theory. I look at ambivalent sexism, both hostile and benevolent sexism, which I'm going to break down in just a moment. And I look at ambivalent sexism across gender, race, and ethnicity. I also look at the role of racial resentment and its extensions. There's been a lot of research in recent years that really pushes uh, a racial resentment to look at 
interracial as well as intraracial, meaning for Black women versus Black men who have higher levels of racial resentment, um, what does that mean for the African American community? So we're looking at intraracial views towards uh, racial resentment as well as Native and non-Native views. Right, And my work also controls or accounts for partisanship, which remains a strong predictor of vote choice, um, linked fate, um, attitudes towards public policy issues like abortion, like undocumented immigration, um, and personal economic anxiety, as well as controlling for social demographics like education. My mixed method approach utilizes national survey data like the CMPS, but also um, gearing up for our focus group discussions because I want to talk to women. I want to know the differences between Black women and Chinese women and Korean women and South Asian women, Mexican and Central American women and white women who are working age, 25 to 64 years old, and how they perceive ambivalent sexism and racial resentment and how it might be actualized in their political behavior and their views. But today's presentation uses weighted data from the 2020 CMPS. All right, what's the motivation for the book project? Well, the 2016 and the 2020 presidential elections really forced an uncomfortable and difficult conversation along race, gender, and party politics in the US. And I know that many of you on the call have had some of these uncomfortable conversations um, in your own family, right? And in your own community, academics to journalists to kitchen table activists to folks at the beauty shop and barber, barber, barber shop wondered why the majority of white women chose Trump over Clinton and then Trump over Biden in the majority again in 2020. And oftentimes scholars look to the gender gap um, and the gender gap is described as the, um, the difference between men and women in the selection of the winning candidate. And so if we want to just look at the, at the gender gap, really since 1980, the gender gap has found that women tend to break um, for the Democratic Party more than men, right? And this has been a long-standing finding, the partisan gender gap in American electoral politics since the 1980s. However, if you look a little bit closer with an intersectional lens, one would find that the percent of white women who voted Democrat um, voted for the Democrat presidential candidate since we've started collecting this data in 1948, would paint a little bit of a different picture than the gender gap narrative. In fact, it's only twice in the nation's history, and this is including Obama years, that um, white women broke for the Democratic Party candidate in the majority. Let's go ahead and look a little bit closer to women's Democratic vote share in presidential elections since we've started collecting this data via the national um, the American National Election Survey in 1948. In fact, looking at the table that looks at all women, um, white women, black women, and Latina women, we know that the stalwarts of the Democratic Party remain African American women, and that white women um, in the majorities have only voted for the Democratic Party twice in our nation's history. In 2020, this trend continued. Um, with white women breaking for the Republican Party candidate in the majorities, while women of color broke for the Democratic Party candidate in the majorities. What about presidential candidate evaluations? The 2020 CNPS also shows us the spread among women. Women are not a monolith, not just in their political behavior, but also in their candidate evaluations. And the spread across ideology. Women are not a monolith. Right, um, and that their ideological spread um, is something that is, is very interesting, um, but particularly for emerging um, electorates like the Asian and Latina electorate. So what do we know about gender and voting behavior in the US? Partisanship and partisan concerns outweigh the role of gender identity. So the earlier work didn't find a statistically significant effect of the role of gender. And in fact, partisanship and party politics played a dominant, more salient role in predicting vote choice. Both women and men are likely to support the candidate of their own political party over the gender of the candidate, for example. And gender biases and stereotypes have been shown to influence evaluations of female candidates, right? However, there's been so, such little evidence of systemic 
sexism or what people would call modern sexism or proxies for modern sexism on vote choice. But we do know that most existing studies of gender differences on vote choice and political behavior are undifferentiated by race and ethnicity. In doing so, you could obscure substantial differences, either overestimating or underestimating the role of gender among women voters by race and ethnicity. Recent research, including my own published research, um, examines how sexism and race work in conjunction with gender to produce electoral outcomes around vote choice. In fact, and I want you to keep this with you as we continue on to the presentation, the same stimulus among different groups, whether that be white women or women of color, can have differing effects on their political behavior. Let's go back to Alcourt. The same heat that melts the butter hardens, also hardens the egg. The same stimulus, the same descriptive statistics, you know, shared views and values can have differing effects how it's actualized in political behavior and attitudes. People of all backgrounds and cultures arguably can harbor prejudices and sexist beliefs about one another. And these beliefs can be internalized and normalized as commonplace, both among and between men and women. And arguably only an intersectional approach, an intersectional position of race and gender for women voters reveals these dynamics. Race and gender are a, a heavy part of the political and power structures in the United States. And the study of the racial hierarchy in the position of white women as first in race, but second in sex, has been shown and well documented by Jane John, as well as many other women in politics scholars. So my own published research in 2018 sought to examine the role of ambivalent sexism towards women in the 2016 election, accounting for racial resentment, accounting for partisanship, accounting for other kinds of factors that are important to any model of vote choice. So I'm also um, going to just uh, pause here for a second and note that I've given this presentation in so many different sectors, whether that's a community-based organization, a senior living community during the a presidential election, and various versions in, in academia and in, in the policy world. And um, invariably, I always have um, women come up, white women come up, and know, honey, and they usually whispering, it's not me, right? And they're sort of saying, like, I'm not the problem here. And I just also wanted to note that these conversations are never easy to have. They're courageous to open up a dialogue and open up a discourse about race and gender and presidential vote choice or policy views. And so none of it is to point the finger, but it is definitely to make sure that we have a greater understand about the, understanding about the role of race and gender in American presidential politics and policy opinions. So let me you know, share with you just a little bit about um, the ambivalent sexism scale, and then we'll look at how it's actualized in the data and also move to um, how, it's, uh, how we see it in 2020, the 2020 CMPS. So over 25 years of research on the ambivalent sexism, largely in psychology, this is a psychological measure. It's called the ambivalent sexism inventory. Um, and it examines uh, the impact of ideologies about women while also drawing attention to how some women accept these system justifying ideologies. The system, um, and so ambivalent sexism has two modes. One is hostile sexism. Um, it reflects negative or antagonistic evaluations and stereotypes about women. Um, most women, so for example, and I'll show you this is how it is actualized in the data. Most women interpret innocent remarks or acts as being sexist and benevolent sexism. Benevolent sexism represents evaluations of women that may appear positive. Women should be cherished and protected, yet are actually, actually have negative uh, effects on gender, for gender equality. So just as a little bit of a background before we go to 2020, and then we move to some questions and answers, um, I want to share with you some findings from the published study. And it um, accounts for ambivalent sexism and first a full model of all women um, and it shows that if you just look at all women and treat women as a monolith that um, women with high levels of ambivalent sexism or racial resentment would be more likely to vote for Trump in 2020 and the dependent variable for this model is vote for Trump but when you disaggregate by race 
and uh, gender, that you also see that the, for ambivalent sexism, that it, be, it remains important and salient as a predictor of voting for Trump in 2016, even accounting for the strong and salient um, uh, findings on partisanship. Um, and um, so the first column is the logistic regression, the second column are, is the marginal effects. But the role of ambivalent sexism for women of color on vote for Trump is negative with no statistical significance. For racial resentment, um, um, racial resentment has a positive influence for those who have high levels of racial resentment for women of color, but the predicted probability or the marginal effect is almost half than it is for white women. And so it's still salient, a salient predictor having high levels of racial resentment towards blacks, but this is less salient than it is for white women. Um, and then the role of partisanship again, it is, it matters, it matters on vote choice, but that doesn't mean that we don't step outside of the box and think about other factors that could take up variance in the model, right? So I just also wanted to show some of the findings from that study where I control for factors related to immigration, factors related to economic anxiety, factors related to race and socioeconomic status, whether you are, are evangelical. Also, we um, in a, the American National Election Survey in 2016 actually had the question on whether or not they had um, they saw the Access Hollywood video. All right. So just wanted to show how some of those these factors were uh, actualized in 2016. So now let's look at some attitudes in 2020. All right. So for the ambivalent hostile sexism scale in 2020, it scales real, really nice at 0.83. The Cronbach app was very nice. Um, it, it, these are the four measures that make up the scale. Um, women fail to appreciate what men do for them. Many men interpret innocent remarks or acts as being sexist. Women seek to gain power by getting control over men. Women, uh, once, a, once, a, once a woman gets a man to commit to her, he tries to, she tries to put him on a tight leash. Right, they make me giggle a little bit too. Right, you know. <laughs> um, so look at the distribution. This table is the distribution of views on what's considered hostile sexism statements by gender and race, and you can see here what the spread is across gender um, and race. And that again, treating all women as a monolith on some of these statements really wouldn't get at the fact that many of the, for many of these statements, some groups of women converge on the statement, and then there are some marked differences between women, but women are definitely not a monolith. The question becomes here, for those with high levels of hostile sexism, what impact does it have on political behavior and attitudinal formation, right? Now here, what about benevolent sexist measures? Like women should be cherished and protected by men. Men are incom incomplete without women. Women compared to men tend to have superior moral sensibility. Men should be willing to sacrifice their own well-being in order to provide financially for the women in their lives. And again, it scales re relatively well together um, for this measure. Let's look at the spread in the 2020 CMPS across um, race and gender. And again, if we look at the green bar that treats all women, women as a monolith, we definitely wouldn't better understand how women view these issues um, in, in these, um, these statements of um, benevolent sexism. Right. And finally, in terms of um, the racial resentment scale, we were able to offer not just the ambivalent sexism scale, which we were not able to do, um, it was not on a national survey of this size in our, in our nation's history. This is the first time ambivalent sexism and racial resentment is on a national survey with sample size this large for racial and ethnic groups. The racial resentment scale has been around for over 20 years, um, if not longer. Um, blacks should work their way up without special favors. Past slavery makes it difficult for blacks to, um, for blacks, blacks have gotten less than they deserve. Blacks must try harder to get ahead. And again, in the CMPS, like the NES, it scales very well together at the 0.83 level. And here's the distribution of views on racial resentment statements by gender, by race and ethnicity among women. And again, if we treat all women as a monolith, we really don't understand the extent to which racial resentment has an impact for women of color, right? And now it raises the question about how these factors and the influence of these factors are actualized in political behavior and in um, attitudes towards various policies. And that is 
the next step of this research that I'm replicating the study from, um, with the from the 2016 data to better understand the extent to which these groups. And one of the improvements for the CMPS is that we did not have sufficient data on Asian and um, not, a, not a large sample of Latinx women, right? So we had to lump all women of color together using the American National Election Survey. Now that we've been able to place it on the CMPS, we can better understand via a disaggregated model by gender and race, all right? So the final thing that I want to show you are gender differences, racial and gender differences on three policy preferences. And again, the data is so rich. There's so many different public policies that we could study. My interests are in uh, legal abortion, undocumented immigration, and I also have a measure related to COVID. So this is women's uh, views on legal abortion for voters only. Um, and it again shows you that women are not a monolith. And if we treat all a, a model of just all women without an intersectional approach, which breaks down between among race and gender, then we really wouldn't understand the support, the spread of support. And by and large, over 50% of all women support legal abortion according to the means and standard deviations from the um, from the CMPS. However, you see marked differences by, by, um, by race and gender, right? White women are the most likely of all the racial and ethnic groups to oppose legal abortion. In terms of undocumented immigration, um, white women are the least likely to support a um, path to citizenship. Um, and so also African-Americans are the most likely to be neutral on this category. But um, unlike what some, much of the media would suggest, that African Americans have high levels of support for undocumented immigrants and a path to citizenship. In terms of um, a prospective COVID mask mandate, um, we do see here as well that women vary greatly in their views. Over 50% of all women support a COVID mask mandate, but that varies by race and gender with white women being the least likely to support a COVID mask mandate and the most likely to oppose a COVID mask mandate. Um, all right, so now what are some of the implications for politics and public policy in understanding the political behavior and policy preferences? Well, white women are the single largest race gender group of voters in the US. They hold substantial sway in who gets elected and which public policy issues become salient. White women consistently behave politically different from women of color, particularly black women, in their vote choice and policy views. And as a research community, if we fail to look at both race, ethnicity, and gender, as well as other kinds of identities like geography, which is what the broader project does, uh, we will fail to understand these differences and to be able to make policy prescriptions and be able to move forward and sort of thinking about the needs and the views of various women. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. That was phenomenal uh, overview and a really exciting research. I'm sure uh, it's going to take a minute for people to process everything that you just shared with us. So I encourage people to get your questions brewing, but I'll jump in with the first one as the prerogative of the moderator. Um, oh, no, Curtis is already at the ready. Are you, Curtis? Do you want to jump in with the first question? Please do. That was a reflex. I didn't yeah. do that. I apologize. No, that's okay. Um, so Dr. Frazier, I would love to hear uh, when the survey data was released and you finally got your hands on the 2020 data, what was the first question you wanted to see the results of when you sort of had this full package of data available? What was the question that you were most brimming with excitement to see the results from? Oh, sure. Um, well, because of what the time in which the data was released a couple of weeks ago, um, legal abortion was heavy in the media, right? And so again, the top line report, which offers um, the data, um, the um, the average results per group disaggregated by race and ethnicity, we were able to open up the top line report and really take a look and look see across race and gender. And I, I think that was among the first questions that I took a peek at 
because of just everything that was happening in the media was was legal abortion to see what voters had to say about it. Um, but of course, the ambivalent sexism measures because it's just so understudied in the social sciences rather than in psychology. I wanted to take a peek at that as well. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I imagine that that moment of release was really exciting when all the data came in. Uh, others, I, I could keep going, but this is an open floor for all of us to ask Dr. Frazier questions. I'll, I'll jump in after all, uh, and good to meet you, uh, Dr. Frazier. Uh, I'm Curtis Valentine, I'm an adjunct professor, but I also uh, serve on the school board here in Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, you referenced it earlier, and I referenced a book in the chat uh, by a former uh, University of Maryland doctoral student who wrote about the longitudinal work of political power in Prince George's County from 1950 to the year 2000. Um, and so I guess my, my question was around sort of disaggregating data um, within the rate within race by socioeconomic background, college education, and the diversity. So if you think about Prince George's County, um, and I've also worked in politics here, uh, there's a healthy amount of diversity socioeconomically, but also even within the African diaspora, when you think about folks who are uh, immigrants to, to Prince George's County, particularly from West Africa and, and the West Indies, and their view, just their view of government and the role that individual citizens, that government plays with citizens. And so um, I've just been really curious about how particularly um, immigrant students uh, perform in our schools compared to uh, those who are indigenous, um, but also how their parents view public education, role of government. Um, and in some cases, you're seeing a rise of conservatism within some of our, uh, uh, those within the diaspora. So I'm curious about whether that's something you looked at or thought about and decided not to go with, or you had that data and have not sort of analyzed it yet, but just the varying political views of uh, particularly black women um, based on college education versus versus not um, from the diaspora or not. Uh, just curious. Yes, thank you, Curtis. I appreciate that. And of course, I know Val Johnson, the UMD PhDs, we roll deep, right? We stay in contact um, and we continue to uplift one another and support one another. So of course I know Val, Marianor, so many of us, and again, we're products of Linda Faye Williams and, and Ron Walters. Um, so we, we definitely stay in contact and her book's amazing. And it was an inspiration for me to write the kind of um, book that my, my first book, so that's great. And the answer to your question is yes, yes, yes. Um, the CMPS has large sample of of African-American and African immigrant, Afro-Caribbean. And that is the main point of collecting large samples of um, varying groups. You, for example, with your question, um, to understand the black experience, right? Now, it could be the case that a place like um, Maryland, that they would collect data that is relative to the black population in the state, right? But without an oversample, you may not have enough cases of Blacks to be able to do the kinds of things that you like to do. So therefore, oversampling to capture um, Afro-Latinos and, and Black immigrants so that we could share not just the African-American experience parsed by gender between men and women, but also to look at Black immigrants. So you could, you could ostensibly look at all those policy issues because we have captured with 800 questions the kinds of policy issues that you care about in the CMPS. But if we didn't have a large enough sample size of Black immigrants, as well as native born Blacks, then we really couldn't um, um, distill down to some of the things that you're most interested in. So um, the work that I do um, with my students, um, that I have a paper on, um, on Black views towards undocumented immigration. In paper, it came out, um, let's see, 20, uh, the book project part of it came out just uh, 20, early 2021. And this is Todd Shaw. So the book um, is on um, after Obama and it looks at black views towards um, undocumented immigration. Um, and then there is another project with a graduate, a different graduate student. Um, and that is published in PRQ. And it looks at um, views on undocumented immigration, not just for African Americans, but across racial ethnic group, but by geography, right? And so again, um, if I may, and I know we have, 
if you if, do you guys mind if I show it one quick table? Is that okay? Okay, I'm just gonna go to this really quick table. Here we go. Really quick, really quickly. So um, you noted Prince George's County, and that was my stomping ground for many years, as well as where I, I spent a lot of time on the highways and byways trying to get field, get, doing field work and trying to get folks in Prince George's County to talk to me and give me an interview, um, including in the school district, right? Um, and so um, one of the things that's important to me and that grew out of that work and that I published on in politics groups and identities around immigration issues is the role of geography, right? And whether there is an, a geographic identity, we care about race, ethnicity, we care about um, sexuality and gender, but whether or not there is a geographic identity at play here. And so the work that I do for the book project utilizes a K-means cluster analysis to better understand geographic place, right? And that not all suburbs are created equal. So lumping them all together to say the suburbs really doesn't mean anything to people on the ground, Curtis, right? So instead, the K-means cluster analysis, borrowing from a typology from Marion Orr, right? But that typology from a demographer, putting it in place at the, at, um, for, to, for use in, in, in work around politics and policy is to create these clusters of very affluent, affluent bedroom developing at risk, old, segregated, and then the central city proper, so that we could better approximate a number of, of policy issues or the way people view um, um, attitudes and um, policy views. But the book project will look at gender and various types of women who live in these kinds of um, geographic types beyond just urban, suburban, rural. So I think that also with a large sample size of Black immigrants and Afro-Caribbeans and native-born Blacks, I'm excited about what we might be able to find, right? And thank you for letting me slide the, that in about my typology too. No, thank you. Dean Orr, please. Dr. Frazier, thank you for an excellent uh, talk, but also uh, just this very exciting work that you've done over many years on the CMPS. Uh, this is a, not just a tool for good scholarship and good policy making, but I think as you pointed out for building a pipeline, a more diverse pipeline of scholars. And so just a, a big shout out to you for that uh, very long-term investment you've made in that. I think it's significant. I'm interested in the policy application of uh, a lot of the things that you find in the CMPS. Obviously, you can point in many directions, but one of the most uh, neuralgic these days is the, the state of American democracy and possibly the fate of American democracy. Have you looked at all at um, the, the data and the CMPS for any insights in terms of uh, not just impacts on uh, um, different communities, but also the involvement of different communities in efforts to uh, either undermine or resist the undermining of democracy. And I'm thinking not just gerrymandering and you know, voter suppression and the like, but there, there are a whole range of things at play right now where your intersectional lens here could be quite powerful. They, are there some interesting things on, on that side of the ledger that you would call our attention to? Yes, thank you so much for that question. And thank you so much for being here. I know that taking the time away from the Dean schedule to listen to an academic talk is, is, is a lot. So I just really appreciate your presence and thank you for being here. It means a lot. Um, I want to turn to, I'm just, I've sort of, um, this is sort of, you can sneak around when you're on Zoom and, and open up a lot of different files that you otherwise wouldn't be able to open. And I'm opening the top line for the CMPS because we asked a number of questions about the insurrection. And that's one of the, um, the value added to 
to the survey is that it's post-election, so we were able to capture views on the insurrection across race and ethnicity, across gender, across a lot of different, and thinking about what, how were various groups perceiving what was happening, what was playing out right before their very eyes. And so to answer your question, I just wanted to um, pull up um, we, a couple of questions that we ask about the insurrection. Um, and may I screen share again, if you don't mind? Okay. All right, so this is just disaggregated by, by race and these are weighted um, results. And so we, Q, um, C53 acts on January 6, 2021, the US Congress was scheduled to meet and vote for the final certification of the state electoral college votes. A group of angry people who supported Trump gathered in DC and attacked the US Capitol in an attempt to stop Congress from voting to certify the final election results. Based on what you saw and heard about the incident, which comes closest to your view? Mostly a protest that went too far, a coordinated act of insurrection against the United States. So those are the two options that folks had. And you can see that there's a spread across race and gender. But again, it would need to be parsed by income, parsed by education, parsed by a variety of different indicators that matter to us who do empirical work. Um, but the spread suggests that there are differences, right, between racial and ethnic groups. Um, and then there's a question in C54 that asks the questions about the role of Trump in inciting the rioters. Um, and um, so a variety of different kinds of things. It asks a question about C C55, about the formal certification of, of the victory for Trump, whether or not it's undermining democracy, protecting democracy, or they don't know, right? And again, some, sometimes we did our due diligence in making sure we provide an opportunity for people to say, I don't know. We have immigrant and non-immigrant um, folks in our survey. And sometimes they're just emerging in their political participation, their attitude formation. And we wanna know the extent to which they they, they don't know and they, they're not sure so that we can better understand those views as well. But we have a myriad of questions because it is a post-election survey and we were able to capture things related to um, the Amer American democracy, feeling thermometers around um, um, uh, our first uh, woman of color president, uh, pres vice president, and a variety of different kinds of things so we can better understand those issues across gender and sexuality and race and ethnicity. I don't know. Um, thank you. Or did I did I answer that sufficiently? Yep. Thank you very much. Let me stop sharing. Excellent. We have a question next from uh, uh, Sarah Marcellin, please. Hi. Um, your presentation was amazing. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a grad student at UMD in the, at the moment, and I'm actually a dual, dual student in public policy and social work. So um, I'm interested in diversity and inclusion, and as someone whose parents are Caribbean descent and looking at your research, I wanted to know how we could use your data to bridge the divide because in America, so many people are divided right now by a lot of the questions you're asking. So how do you, can you use this data to really bridge the gap and bring in more unity to you know even protect democracy? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for you, Miss Sarah. Okay, so you're not on camera. So I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm not missing you, right? But I love this question and thank you so much for it. I, um, I, I'm hoping that we start with a courageous dialogue, a greater dialogue, both within our families and communities and then outside, sometimes starting in our own household. But sometimes talking to our own family members is it, quite difficult, right? Um, and it's not an assumption that all African-American families have um, family members who may vote Democrat. Sometimes we have very conservative family members um, who are conservative on a number of policy views like legal abortion like same-sex marriage, right? So I suggest we starting within, um, raising some of these issues, but it takes courage, it's not easy. So if it's not easy in your own family, imagine how difficult it can be in policy spaces, right? Or um, in the classroom. But I think the top line report is just one avenue to begin the conversation um, around these concerns. And then it will raise even more concerns um, around gender and, and sexuality and other kinds of things. But I'm hoping 
that this is just an anchor. The, the survey is an anchor to start that discourse that's very necessary. Um, we have a large Im Black immigrant um, sample that I'm hoping, hopefully you can get your hands on and maybe do your own analysis and um, co-authorships and those kinds of exciting things. But discourse, 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 we are constantly in need of ways to um, can continue to bring more folks into the conversation, making sure they feel comfortable to engage and that their voices will be heard. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that this helps to start that conversation. I can't tell you that it's not going to be uncomfortable. Thank you so much for your answer. Others, please jump in. Ah, Meg, please, yes. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for not only the richness of what you're doing, but the impassioned way you're doing it and for being such a change maker. Really appreciate the vibrancy of it. My question is, um, I've worked in my NGO a lot with uh, di the diaspora from East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia in particular, of which there's a large contingency here in the Northern Virginia uh, area. So my question is, um, I always find sometimes that my, my assumptions about the diaspora are incorrect. And I wish I could get at a better sense of attitudes or connectedness with them. Although this is out of your scope, I just wondered if you had some connect connections that, that might be helpful into the Ethiopian diaspora, Uganda. Uh, is that something that uh, you might follow up with me on? I, I definitely would. Um, and I, 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 you know, we can pick one another's brain. I, this has been a learning experience for me. I will know in 2016, we didn't step outside the box and collect oversamples of Black immigrants, right? We, we uh, were very careful in bringing in Chrissy Greer and um, Candace Watt-Smith because they have been doing this work for a long time. That's the importance of partnerships and collaborations because where I, I, I'm, I don't know the answer, I can reach out to these amazing folks who are our project partners to get the work done. And so the Black immigrant sample is a success because we brought on oversampled directors, Christy Greer and Candace Watt Smith, who've written books and articles on Black immigrants and the Black immigrant experience in the United States. And they helped us to better understand which populations we should sample. They helped us to understand where we should get the invitation and the, um, the instrument translated into which languages. So all of the Haitian Creole, like I alone would not have thought that we need to translate this in Haitian Creole, right? But it, but it was because of the collaboration and the partnership with those who know way more than me, right? Um, I'm, I'm helping to lead and steer the ship um, and to actualize my vision here but bringing on partners is the way that I've been able to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, I, that's one of the first pieces of advice is be fearless and bringing on the folks who are better at it. <laughs> and they can, and they can, you know, help you bring your vision to fruition for the, for the story that you want to tell um, about Ethiopians right here or right there in, um, in Northern Virginia. Thank you so much. That's inspiring. We'll talk later. <laughs> Peter, I saw you had your real hand and then your virtual hand up. So that's an eagerness that I want to capture. So Peter, please. I was also muted, but Peter, you're muted. Um, so one of the things that divides our populations is uh, the media that we turn to. Um, I have never turned my radio to anything other than NPR. Uh, I doubt that my television would know where anything other than PBS is. So in collecting these data, did you also collect data on what media individuals use and how did that break out across groups? Oh, you know, I'm going to go back to the, but first of all, I just want to say it's an honor to meet you, Peter. Um, uh, Anyway, I, I, um, I'm blushing a little bit because I, I know you've been at, U, at the University of Maryland for quite some time and I can't wait to chat with you later on, but oh. it's an honor to meet you. <laughs> um, all the, these folks' names that I knew as a student and then later in my academic career, so this is just a lot of, it's a big treat for me as well. All right, so um, media. <laughs> of course, those who study race, racial ethnic politics, uh, race, ethnicity, and policy, 
Um, we care a lot about um, ethnic media, right? And ethnic media outlets. Um, so let's look at some of the ways in which we studied it or ask these kinds of questions in the CMPS. And I'm gonna just screen share really briefly. I know we're short on time. So one of the questions that we asked is uh, a Q QC90, and we, we wanted to understand the extent to which they are utilizing social media, for example, and how that looks different by race and ethnicity. But again, the data is so rich with so many cases that you can look at other identities as well, as well as geography, right? Mapping where um, people are getting their particular kinds of media. And so we, we talked, we asked specifically whether or not they discussed the Canada political issue by posting on an internet site, for example, like Facebook or social media, because that was really huge during the 2020 election. I'm just going to poke around here, but you can see that there is a spread across uh, race, race and ethnicity, but by and large, a lot of people were not posting about a candidate or political issue. They were probably sharing cat pictures or, you know, or puppy pictures or something like that, I'm not sure. But let's look at a, a few other um, media related questions. Thinking about the issue of police violence and Black Lives Matter, besides attending an event, did they engage in social media or Twitter or, web, or other website about BLM? So this is tying it to various policy issues of the day and whether or not they engage these issues on social media. So there's so many, it's just a myriad of ways that we can think about um, media. The Me Too movement, for example. Did they share information in the media on um, uh, uh, Me Too? Uh, let's see if we get one more good one here. I'm still excited and going through the data all the time myself because we just got it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, oh, this is one. Um, so I think that we do um, we do have a number of questions about media, and I know that in the survey there are also questions about ethnic media. So do you utilize sort of um, 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 my, the Spanish language media? I'm blanking on it right now, but um, that those are some questions that were of interest as well. Um, Spanish language media as well as um, black media and other kinds of media outlets in, and also media in, in language for other groups. Telemundo, somebody told me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry about that. The brain <laughs> this is so rich and I think this is a master class and why Zoom, while it has its downsides, can be so advantageous to have that data at your fingertips and to be able to search for it. And what a treat for us that we get this preview of stuff that people don't have access to. So what a delight. Nathan, please, floor is yours. Yeah, I'll second that. This is a treat. Thank you so much, Dr. Frazier. And uh, and thank and it's, it's great to meet someone who's so heavily involved with the CNPS, which is a fantastic project. Uh, I'm wondering what work you've done on, uh, on the question of turnout in elections, um, because you have data that could really add to what we know and understand right now, which I don't think is very much about why people actually vote in elections. There, that's a big discussion in the run up to every election, uh, whether people are enthusiastic, what their big issues are, and then finally, whether or not they're actually gonna cast their votes. And for these populations, I think those are questions that are, that are really relevant this time around and probably will be for the next, uh, for the immediate future. Have you looked into that? Have you looked into the capacity of the CNPS to uh, really develop a, a, a much better model of turnout, why people vote? Well, you are speaking my language over there. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> because that's that's one of the primary things that in, in, in my world that we care about and why yeah. we um, seek to engage in this endeavor. And I was also kicking myself because this was one of the things that I thought about after I answered Dean Orr's question about the democracy, yeah. right, and for the turnout. So you must have been reading my mind and gave me an opportunity to come circle back to it. So um, I'm going to share screen one more time, one more time, because I do want to show a little bit about just basic questions that we ask. Now, the uniqueness of the 2020 election was that for the first time in the nation's history, voters were um, casting ballots um, via mail like never before. And usually when we think of racial and ethnic voting, we think about that sort of solemn standing online, vote souls to the polls, those kinds of things for African-American voter turnout. But for 2020, because of the pandemic, right, we had African-Americans voting at record numbers via mail-in ballot. And we were able to capture some of the reasons in which African-Americans may go, um, wait, may elect to even stand in line despite the pandemic, um, um, via feeling that their vote 
would, their, their ballot wouldn't be counted, those kinds of other things. So one of the things we know here, so we have a lot, look, Nathan, we got a lot of questions on voter turnout, but also mode of voting. It's not just enough to study the act of voting, but the mode of voting. So, um, and also to, this here looks at the spread by race and ethnicity, but did you vote by mail or absentee ballot? Vote early in, in person or vote in person on election day at your precinct or voting center, right? This is a classic question that now has to be on the 2020, any kind of um, exit polls, et cetera, because mailing in your ballot is still something that people are going to have to do. We have the data to show, um, and also we can create models that predict why one would turn in a ballot via absentee US mail, Dropbox, in person, or on voting on election day. Looking at African Americans, for example, um, African Americans were the most likely of any racial and ethnic group in 2020 to vote in person. And we want to better understand why that th this group would risk their well being when they had the opportunity to cast their ballot in person. So this is just one exemplar, but the data is so rich and so many controls that you could really create a model by race and ethnicity, native born, non-native born, all those kinds of things that are exciting. And I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Oh, thank you very much. We probably have time for one more question. Ooh, Juan Pablo in the chat. Um, how could we use your research, or how, excuse me, how could your research inform voting rights legislation? Again, sort of translating what we're seeing in the survey to a really contemporaneous down the street debate on voting and voting rights legislation from Juan Pablo. Yes, and I will say, I love being in this space where people care about policy issues. And it's not just like a future research will, but it's like future research should right now, right? Um, <laughs> so, or how our research informs these concerns right now. So that's a great question. Again, there's so many questions in the survey directly asking about, um, about whether or not they felt that their vote would, be, would matter, uh, would count. Um, and so questions that serve as proxies. No, we're not directly asking if you were suppressed, <laughs> but we have, we're testing, we're able to test theories in the existing literature that and help us to create proxies for voter suppression and also to map geographically because we'll have the contextual data. So we train students to, um, through statistics and GIS and a, a lot of skill sets to be able to carry out your research question. Um, so um, we can um, merge in data from vote history data um, for the last couple of election cycles to better understand if the respondent voted in the previous election, if they have re-entered the electorate in 2020, but they didn't vote in 2016, for example, African Americans and other groups, thinking about um, factors related to how they cast their ballot. Um, so we want all of these kinds of ways to think of thinking about voter turnout, right? And in our American democracy to inform um, people on the ground, particularly when they're thinking about which groups to galvanize, right? I'll just share very briefly, I'm working on a project here with the Secretary of State's office that um, looks at um, moves beyond just um, surnames for Latinos and Asians, but also using an innovative approach to combining geographic space and surnames for understanding the geographic mobility of Blacks and whites, for which surnames you really know, they're, you know, you're Jackson, right, or Montgomery, you could be Black or white, but we're combining surnames with geographic space to better approximate where voters live here in the state of California. And this was a novel strategy um, developed by my colleague, Matt Barreto. And now along with myself and um, other scholars and graduate students, we're trying to map um, um, geographically where voters now live, particularly given the changing demographics here in California. But this is also um, used widely in other states as well. So we, we're doing a variety of different things to try to capture voter turnout. But at the fore, we want our work to speak to um, policymakers at the local, state, and national level. Um, and also, one, one final thing here, I learned how to write 
those three to five page memos in public policy school. And now we write long papers and books that nobody really reads that much, but they, cause they wanted to steal down to three to five page policy memo. So, and that's what you are getting trained to do as graduate students and or undergraduates. And so I'm sort of like, I have to always, you know, invoke my, my MPP where while we wanna be long-winded in political science, the policy world, they just want us to distill it down to the, to the main points, something that they could be useful for their community-based group or for their election or what have you. And so again, I, I, I lean on my public policy degree all the time to be able to, to do that and to distill the information and make it accessible to folks um, in the real world. What a wonderful note to end on. Um, I wanna be mindful of your time. I know you have a busy afternoon uh, of different meetings. And so it is my honor and privilege to be the final voice of gratitude and thanks for your time and for your wisdom and for being present with us in, in this virtual space. Um, so thank you, Dr. Frazier, truly uh, for your, everything that you've shared with us.